Good morning. Um, if you notice the picture on the, the, the bulletin for this uh, service today, it's a question, are you born again or just religious? Uh, I never really expected to find that particular picture, but I found it out there. And uh, boy, that really goes with the thoughts for today's message, which the title is, What Does It Mean to Be Born Again? And our text is very familiar to you, I'm sure. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Remember, this is Nicodemus' interview with Jesus. And this is probably one of the most important passages uh, in the New Testament on the subject of the new birth. Do you realize that the expression to be born again occurs only in this chapter in the entire Bible. It's not found anywhere else in the New Testament. However, the evidence of it is um, quite obvious throughout all the epistles and the book of Acts and so forth like that. But this is where Jesus introduces it. And he doesn't introduce it just as a slogan like so many churches use today. He introduces it as a reality and the door of the kingdom of God. So let's, let's read uh, these verses. I know it's a rather long reading, but it's all very important. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, you know, that's a rather abrupt change in thought right there. I wonder if there was more conversation in between uh, uh, Nicodemus uh, saying these things and Jesus jumping right in and saying, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus didn't ask anything about the kingdom. He's just asking, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, we know you're somebody. And he says, I say, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, this is reasonable. Next, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. How many of us connect John 3.16 
with Jesus talking with Nicodemus, telling him, you must be born again. God so loved the world. You know, most of the time you never hear, hear these verses taught in the same sermon. We'll take one sermon over here and be born again, and then another day pick a sermon on John 3, 16, but never tie them together. But the fact is that Jesus tied it together with what he's talking about to Nicodemus. And the issue with Nicodemus was, hey man, you need to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. So according to Jesus, the new birth is the only way to enter the kingdom of God. Underscore that in your minds, okay? The new birth is the only way to enter the kingdom of God. And from the text we just read, we find that Nicodemus was baffled by the very thought of being born again. Now, Nicodemus was a very religious man, and he could see no connection between his religious life and anything else he might need to be accepted into the kingdom of God. He looked at his life. He was a Pharisee, okay? He was a leader of the Israelites, and he could make no connection between uh, of anything else being needed to enter the kingdom of God. Hey, I'm religious. I'm a good man. I keep the law of the Moses. I'm already in the kingdom of God, he thought. Well, his problem was that he did not recognize that the outward practice of religion, no matter how sincere, was not the same as being in the kingdom of God. Amen. Now, Jesus counters Nicodemus' objection in verse 6, making it plain to him, there is an irrecon irreconcilable difference between the physical life and the spiritual life. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. What Jesus says here puts the flesh, or we could say outward religion, in direct opposition to that which is spiritual. And friends, this is a foundation fact of the kingdom of God. This is one of those things that you have to really acknowledge and understand to effectively enter into and be in the kingdom of God, okay? It seems that what Jesus said struck the conscience of Nicodemus and kind of turned on a spiritual light the man had never, be seen, had never seen before. Because in verse 7, Jesus tells him, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again or as the Living Bible renders his words, so don't be surprised at my statement that you must be born again. What happened here is not unique to Nicodemus. It happens every time people have that first serious encounter with Jesus. And let me tell you this, every human being that's born into this world, at some time and in some ways, has an encounter with Jesus, okay? Now, before people have this encounter with Jesus, they tend to believe they are good people or even religious people that will surely make it into heaven when they die if there is a heaven. It's kind of the attitude that's out there in most of the people of the world. They base their belief on the good things they do in their life by the way, are good things which they should do. And many rely on their religious beliefs and practices. But at some time, this sense that there must be more to the kingdom of God does challenge their opinion of their well-being before God. And in these encounters, Jesus is trying to make them aware that they need much more than fleshly, as he put it, or merely human good works or religious professions to enter the kingdom of God? The answer is, 
and always will be, you must be born again. Now, being born again has become a common expression. <clears throat> the holiness movement in the later 1800s preached the necessity of the new birth loudly and fervently. And there were great revivals across this country and on into Europe, and missionaries went out into Africa and Asia and around the world preaching the new birth fervently. And then when that quieted down, the fundamentalist movement of the 1920s and 30s picked it up and preached the new birth emphatically. And then when that quieted down, the evangelical movement picked it up and made it their message. In spite of religious rallies, crusades, and denominations championing the new birth, the, new, the flesh, or mere religion, predictably quenched the spirit, and the new birth was reduced to just a slogan. And here we are today. With the cultural decline into secularism, the idea of being born again became a slur intended to make a sincere Christians look stupid and merely pawns of conservative intolerance. If you go out there in the world and say you've been born again, <laughs> they think you're an idiot. Today, what professes to be the Christian church has been overcome mostly by humanism and is shaded with Marxist paganism it does not even recognize. But yet, it still holds up the expressions of the new birth and being born again like posters in a street demonstration. Hey, we believe in being born again, but it's a slogan to them. And having said that, I recognize there are those who truly understand and have experienced the new birth. But my friend, the majority appears to not really understand what that means and may never have experienced it, and they are just religious, just modern-day Nicodemuses. So, what does it mean to be born again? First of all, let me say this. The new birth is not adding religion to one's life. Hey, true, that's not the new birth. Nicodemus, was a very religious man, a very good man, whose life was exemplary. Surely he could have been welcomed into the kingdom of God with open arms, right? But a conviction overcame him, and the realization began to dawn on him that in spite of all his religion, he was still a person plagued by sin in his life. Not really bad sins, but still sin that brought guilt into his life. He still had to bring sacrifices to the temple because of sins that he had committed. And in hearing Jesus talk about being born again, he asked the ultimate question, how can these things be? How can these things be? Now, in that statement, there's something our English language does not quite capture of what is really being asked here. Young's literal translation renders this question a little closer to the original words and meaning of Nicodemus. It puts it this way, how are these things able to happen? Okay, how can these things be? Or how are these things able to happen? What's the cause? What makes this come about? It's a more pointed question than just how can these things be? How can these things be basically dismisses it. But when you ask how is it able for this to happen, it's like you're asking, tell me please how this can happen. 
And that's really what Nicodemus was doing. Nicodemus wants to learn the cause of the new birth. Jesus had just told him that to be born again is to be born of the Spirit. He already answered the man's question. But he still, how is this able to take place? Now, commentators tend to see what Nicodemus, Nicodemus says here as his unwillingness to understand what Jesus had just told him. And I'm really kind of amazed by that because I just don't see that. I think his question comes out of surprise at the realization that his religious life has not brought him into the kingdom of God. To me, it's as if he was saying, I've lived a righteous life and a very sincere and devout, but all this has not really changed me and really made my life to be consistent with all what I know to be the holiness of God. If all my human effort can't do this for me, what can? That's kind of my understanding of what Nicodemus is saying to Jesus. And I think this because of what Jesus says to him in the following verse. He tells Nicodemus of God's love in sending the real agent of the new birth. Jesus tells him in verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay? How are these things able to happen? The answer is because God has so loved the world. That's where the ability lies with the love of God. And he gave his only begotten son. That's the action of God's love to solve man's sin problem. And my friend, to enter the kingdom of God, all you have to do is believe, accept his reality. And this is seen that all human efforts of goodness and religion are incapable of ushering people into the kingdom of God. Jesus tells Nicodemus in verse 13 that he, Jesus, personally has come down from heaven to make the new birth able to happen in people's lives. And in verse 14, Jesus alludes to the real agent of the new birth, by reminding Nicodemus of what's taught in Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9, where people were saved from poisonous snake bite by looking on the model of, of a snake that was lifted up by Moses. That was a picture. That was a type, okay? Nicodemus did not know this at the time, but this, what Jesus was talking about, was a reference to the crucifixion of Jesus, where he made atonement for the sins of the world. And it's interesting that after the crucifixion, Nicodemus was one of the people that helped to put Jesus' body in the tomb. Amen. Wow. Wow. Do you begin to see why this passage in John, the third chapter, is so important to the message of the gospel and understanding the necessity of being born again and what it is? Okay, well, Jesus told him in verse 15 that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal lives. And from this we have to understand that believing in Jesus is not just mental assent to the facts of what happened to him, okay? Not just knowing, okay, yeah, I know Jesus died on a cross. I believe that's a true historical fact. That's not believing in Jesus Christ. Barnes explains it this way. Whoever puts confidence in him as able and willing to save going back to Jung's literal translation of the question, okay? Able to save and willing to save. All who feel that they are sinners, that they have no righteousness of their own, are willing to look to Him as their only Savior. Believing in Jesus. He's my only hope. 
He's the only answer to my sin problem. He is the only one that can give me a new life. You see, it is personal sin that keeps people out of the kingdom of God. And it is only through accepting and trusting what Jesus did on the cross that our sins can be taken away. And this is the new birth. Repenting sin and trusting Jesus for the forgiveness and cleansing from sin is what it means to be born again. 1 John 1, 9, the Bible says and reveals what the genesis of the new birth is. It says there, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is a spiritual transaction that takes place. Okay? Sin separates people from God, placing them in a condition the Bible calls spiritual death. In verse 7 of this chapter, it tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. And the result of this cleansing from sin inducts us into the kingdom of God, as we are also told in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. It says, For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. How does that happen? By repenting and confessing Jesus and allowing the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse you from all sin. That way you are transferred into the kingdom of God. This is also expressed, well, let me say this. The new birth is a spiritual resurrection that produces a radical change in both the spiritual and moral constitution of the human life. And this is expressed very plainly in one of my favorite passages, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18, where the Apostle Paul wrote for us, Therefore, if anyone, who's anyone? Okay, I see some anyone's raising up. For God so loved the world. Who's the world? Anyone. Whoever believes in Jesus. Who is anyone? Okay. Anyone is in Christ. He is a new creation. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means being born again. What does that mean? Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have in fact become new. And what does that mean? Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. We've been transferred into the kingdom of his dear son through the blood of Jesus Christ, which brings about the new birth. Now, the new birth is not like a New Year's resolution. This is a two-sided transaction that gives real evidence of spiritual life and a personal relationship with God, according to Romans 8, verse 16. The Bible says there, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. There's communication in the new birth, okay? So it's not, not a, a New Year's resolution. It's a two-sided transaction. The Holy Spirit speaks to us as we recognize and respond to what He's telling us. Two-way street going on here, okay? Church membership doesn't do that for you. That's a one-way street. And you want a two-way street where the Spirit of God can interact with you and you can interact with the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? So, the new birth gives spiritual life wherein we experience a communion with God that enables us to speak with God and be able to hear or sense what God speaks to us. Now, 
the new birth is really very simple, <laughs> as Nicodemus found out. And I don't know who wrote this course, but there is a course that expresses the nature of the new birth so simply, so plainly, and describes everything that we've just talked about. I'm not going to sing it to you, but I'm going to read the words to you, and it's there in your outline if you want to follow along. Do you know that you've been born again? Do you know that you've been born again? Does the Spirit dwell within, bearing witness that you've been cleansed from every sin and stain? Are you ready if the Lord should come, or today your soul should claim? Can you face eternal years free from doubt and dread and fears? Do you know, know, know that you've been born again? Amen.